right, so far we have covered the first six letters. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, and Vav. And we've covered three vowel sounds, the comets, the cholam, and the shuruk. Okay, so that's where we are thus far. Comets, you'll recall, it's a short A sound, the cholam, a long O, and the shuruk, a long U, or U, okay, as in room. Right? The vowels are much harder to remember than the letters, so. Okay, so we're on to our seventh letter today. That letter is called Zion. Zion makes the sound of the letter Z, as in zebra. Being the seventh letter, its numerical value is seven. And in Paleo-Hebrew, uh, the Zion looks something like this. Uh, the Hebrew word Zion means a weapon, and so this could be considered a sword, or it could also be considered a plow, kind of reminiscent of the verse that their swords shall be beaten into plowshares. So perhaps that's an allusion to this letter in some way. Uh, from the Zion came the Greek letter Zeta and our modern Z. That's the Zion. The eighth letter is Chet. Um, as I mentioned last week, this is Chet and not Chet. The spelling is unfortunate. We don't have English letters that represent the sound the chet makes. It is a ch, and you'll see it transliterated as a ch, even though it does not in any way make a ch sound. It's a ch. Uh, make sure people are kind of in a, you know, outside of a five foot radius of you when you first start pronouncing this letter. Uh, the eighth letter, its numerical value, therefore, is eight. Um, one thing to pay attention to with the chait is in the upper left, the chait is closed. This is what differentiates it from the hay, where there is a gap. Okay, so chait and hay are frequently uh, mistaken one for the other, especially when you have real small uh, type. So that's just something to be aware of. The chet in Paleo-Hebrew looks something like this. And it's thought to represent either a ladder or a fence. Because you can also see it turn sideways sometimes which is more reminiscent of the fence. Uh, there is no Hebrew word, at least no modern Hebrew word, chet. So unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, any other hints as to what it might mean. But in any case, it became the Greek eta. 
and our modern H. Okay, with the chait, we can introduce some new words. Okay. <clears throat> so, first word I gave was aleph bait. The comets under the aleph. All right. This is pronounced av. It means father. Okay, the pronunciation comes from the aleph is silent. The comets, you then move to the pronunciation of the vowel underneath. So the comets makes the short A sound, followed by the bait with no dogish makes a V sound. In Hebrew, it is read right to left. Okay, so put all together silent, A, ah, and then a V. So the full pronunciation is av, okay, which is father. All right. If we have an aleph with a comets, followed by a chait, this is pronounced ach. Short A of the comets, followed by the ch of the chait, makes ach. And ach is a brother. So av is father, ach is brother. Any questions about this? We also have a word that begins with chait. Well, there are many words that begin with chait, but I'm going to share one of them with you now. Chait, again, are comets vowel, followed by a gimel. So we have the ch of the chait, the a ah of the comets, and the g of the gimel altogether is pronounced chag. And chag is a festival. And many things can be considered a chag. Um, the uh, days of unleavened bread are called the Chag HaMatzot, the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Many of the feast days are called Chagim, festivals. Um, and just a party in general could be called a Chag. <laughs> Chanukah is a Chag. The name Chanukah means dedication. And the full name could be uh, Chag Chanukah, although that's a mouthful. <laughs> Dedic yes, Chanukah on its own means dedication. Chag Chanukah would be the, yes, the Feast of Dedication in full. But in general, well, I mean, Chanukah, you know, just like Pesach, technically Pesach or Passover refers specifically to the Passover offering. And so the full day would be called either Chag Pesach or, you know, call it, call it what you will, Yom Pesach, day of, day of the Passover offering. Um, but in short, you know, it's just like, you know, we would say, you know, Easter instead of Easter Sunday. It's just, uh, it does refer to, <clears throat> Hanukkah does refer to the festival itself, but it's also a word that means dedication, so. Okay, so Chag is a festival. All right, our next letter looks something like that. 
This letter is called Tate. <clears throat> and it makes the sound of the letter T. It's the ninth letter. Its numerical value is 9. In Paleo Hebrew, Tate looks like this. And um, there are various things that could represent. One of them is a basket. Uh, the Hebrew word teat means mud, which would be one of the constituent uh, parts of a basket lining the bottom to make it watertight. The tate became the Greek theta, or in its lowercase. Um, it does not have a modern English equivalent, although in Old English there was actually a letter that looked something like this that was called eth, and it made a th sound just like the theta. But that has fallen into disuse. And the Tate does not appear in a great number of words, but there are a few very, very common words in which it does appear. And the most common word in which it appears is spelled Tate, Vav with a Cholam, and Beit with no Dagish. Okay? So this is pronounced the T of the Tate. Vav with a cholam is the vowel long O. Again, when the vav has the cholam, it loses its consonant value, so it is not pronounced as a V. It becomes part of the vowel and becomes a long O. And then the bait with no dogish is pronounced as a V. So altogether, this is pronounced tov. And tov means good. The Tate also appears in a number of other very significant words, um, but this is by far the most common. <laughs> and you'll hear this all the time in expressions like Boker Tov, which means good morning, Lila Tov means good night, uh, the song Hine Matov, behold how good, and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together, the vocabulary of which you'll know most of by the time you're through with this class. <laughs> um, So, any questions about this word? All making sense how the consonants and vowels function together and the order of uh, order of reading? I had okay. a, a question about the word before, the hag. Yes. Uh, what is the difference between that and moed? Okay. Um, yeah, no, I know. The, okay, the question is one of vocabulary. What's the difference between a chag, which is a festival, and a moed, which is an appointed time? Um, it's a good question. Chag specifically denotes a festival as in a celebration or a, really a party would be a good rendition, although it, you know, doesn't necessarily include the elements we would think of being in a party today. Um, the root of chag is, is, uh, is a, a root word that means to go in a circle. So it kind of implies dancing in a circle, like the Davidic dancing they do upstairs. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's a festive, joyous occasion. Whereas a moed is, frequently a moed is also a chag, but that is not always the case. For example, uh, Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement, is not a chag. It is not a festival. It is not a joyous occasion, but it is an appointed time. Um, but it is a solemn time. <laughs> it is a very serious time. So um, that would be the primary difference. A moed would just be like an appointment, mark a date on your calendar, uh, whereas a chag is a celebration. So 
a, a day can be both a chag and a moed, um, but there is a technical difference between the two. All right. Our tenth letter is the yod. Uh, the yod makes the sound of the letter Y, as in young, the y sound. The tenth letter, so its numerical value is 10. In the modern script, yod is the smallest letter. And to give you an idea of what it looks like next to other letters, here's a bait next to a yod, here's a vav next to a yod. Very small and written at the top of the line. The Yod looks very different in Paleo Hebrew. And what it represents is a hand. The Hebrew word Yod means hand. But it doesn't just mean a hand from the wrist to the fingers. Um, a yod is a hand including the forearm. So this symbolizes um, several things. Uh, another Hebrew word is yamin, which means the right hand. And it's the hand of power or strength. It's the active hand, since most people are right-handed. Nothing against anyone who's left-handed. Um, it means the dominant hand, so the hand that you do everything with. So it's the active hand, the dominant hand, the strong hand. Um, the yod became the Greek iota, or iota. And our English I and J. Was first in English, there was only the I, and the J grew out of that. Iota is Greek. Uh, no, the letter, the letter itself in the. So when they don't care one iota, they're talking about that letter. That yes, they're talking about because the iota in Greek is also the smallest letter in Greek, and incidentally, in the verse in Matthew uh, chapter five, don't remember the exact verse, but that says, "Not one jot or tittle shall be taken from the law." In the Greek, yes, five seventeen, Matthew five seventeen, the uh, Greek there is not one iota. And in the Hebrew, which is what he most likely was speaking, he would have said not one yod. Not the smallest letter. Yeah, the, now the other word, tittle, which I haven't actually looked up, could well refer to some other pointing. The enlarged letters. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, metaphorically it could be referring to the the letters and to the, the markings, but literally in the Greek it says iota, and which comes from yod, and so, you know, there's no, there are no iotas in the Torah unless he's reading from the Septuagint, but there are many yods, so it makes sense that that's what he's talking about, not the smallest letter. Because he does say that. Yes, right, yeah, some translations even render it that way, so that, you know, because a jot, you know, that's subject to a lot of interpretation, but if what he meant was the smallest letter, and that's something we can relate to in English. So, but the yod, in any case, was the precursor to the iota, which was the precursor to the I and the J. Um, and our J was originally pronounced as a Y. So, if you go back far enough, English resembles Hebrew a lot more than it does today. That's where they get J from. That's exactly where they get it from. Yes. Yes, and just to go on a tangent on that, um, you'll hear a lot about the word uh, Jesus. Clearly, that's not what they called him. You know, that's not his Hebrew name. His Hebrew name was Yeshua. How did it go from Yeshua to Jesus? Okay, that's a topic of some, some debate. Some people think that uh, Jesus comes from Zeus, 
Some people think that it comes from sus, which is the Hebrew word for horse. How actually did it arrive, you know, did it go through that process? Um, my contention is that there's not some nefarious scheme to make us pronounce it incorrectly in English, but it's actually, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> but that it's actually an honest transliteration, and what we lose is a loss between languages, not a loss between uh, devilish intellect. <laughs> um, now, I haven't gone through all the letters yet, but I'm just going to kind of follow, follow the logic here. Uh, Hebrew for Yeshua, there are two options. Okay, this is the short form, Yeshua, which means salvation. Then there's the full form, Yehoshua. This is what Joshua, uh, what his name was, Yehoshua. And um, so when this transfers into Greek, they use the best approximation they can. So to approximate the y sound, Greek combines two letters, the iota and the epsilon. Given e or y, okay, that's an approximation. Greek has no sh, has no sh sound, okay, so they approximate that by, um, by the sigma. Okay. Yeshu, so then they have a upsilon. And I'm writing this all in caps in Greek, but it would actually be written as a proper name in the lowercase here. Okay, now why is there this, this other sigma at the end? Why is there this us? Because there's, you know, Yeshua does not end in an S sound, so what's, what's up with that? Well, in Greek, masculine names are denoted by a sigma at the end. That is why we have Moses instead of Moshe. Okay, Moshe suffers the same problem as Jesus. Okay, because they have the M, they have the O, but they have no sh, so it just becomes an S. Okay, E, they got the E at the end, right? But then to denote that this is in fact a masculine name, they add an S at the end, so it becomes Moses instead of Moshe. Uh, you'll see in the New Testament uh, the names of some of the prophets uh, badly butchered, like um, Isaiah becomes Esaias. What's up with the S at the end? There's no S in Isaiah. It's denoting that this is, in fact, a masculine name. So the same thing happens to Yeshua or Yehoshua. This S is added at the end. There's no SH because there's no SH in Greek. And they approximate the Y sound at the beginning. Okay, so... Then when this gets into English, we render it something like this. Later on, the J enters. The I splits into the I and J. And then later after that, the J changes sounds. So we wind up with Jesus. But go back far enough in English, and nobody is calling him Jesus. They're calling him Jesus, just like the Greeks did. All right. So it's uh, it's a feature of transliteration, and you know it's it's uh, if you've ever heard somebody who you know spoke a radically different language, Chinese or uh, something like that, pronounce your name, especially if your name is multisyllable, it'll get it'll get confused pretty quick because uh, all languages don't have the same sounds and all languages don't have the same patterns of speech. It's just like if I tried to pronounce you know, certain foreign names, I, I'd get lost real quick. <laughs> and uh, So anyway, Yeshua has gone through uh, two languages by the time it gets to us, and so that's why it becomes Jesus. If they'd go straight from the Hebrew to the English, we could get it right, all except for the end, because we don't have a sound actually that approximates the ion. 
Um, but that's a story for another time when we covered the ayin. But yes, if we just went straight from the Hebrew, we could easily come up with this. And people would pronounce that just fine. But it's because we went through Greek that we have Jesus. And uh, the trend is that people are becoming more and more aware of this name and of the Hebrew language. And so, who knows, one day, perhaps this will fall into obsolescence and the majority of Christians will be saying Yeshua. I know for sure one day that the majority of Christians will. I'm just saying during our lifetime this may happen because uh, the information is getting out there. So anyway, so I don't think this name is bad, but after being filtered twice, it's, uh, we just don't pronounce it the same as anybody who knew Yeshua would have pronounced his name. So but anyway, I just wanted to kind of uh, go on a tangent on that. Well, good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's, uh, glad it's kicking in for you. So, um, the yod is part of a number of very significant words. Obviously, Yeshua. Um, words that we've already using letters that we've already covered. Uh, the yod is part of the word yad. Okay, this is yod with a comets underneath, followed by a dalit. So we pronounce the Y of the Yod, the short A of the comets, and then the D of the Dalit. Okay, making Yod. Um, and this week I passed out a sheet that has the vocabulary that we're, we've covered uh, in the class thus far. So these words are all on there. Um, Yad is a hand. Uh, oh, and just to digress about that sheet, you'll notice the word, the Hebrew word on the right side, the English word, uh, the English uh, translation on the left. In between, there's a, a field um, that I've labeled type. Type is actually indicating the gender of the word, which is a subject we won't cover extensively until intermediate Hebrew. But if you look up a word in a dictionary, a uh, Hebrew word in a Hebrew dictionary, it will have that little indicator there indicating the gender of the word. So I've gone ahead and just put that down. Um, the small zion indicates that the word is masculine, and a small nun, which is a letter we haven't covered yet, uh, indicates that a word is feminine. So don't worry too much about that just yet. I just have it there so that later on you've got the gender along with the word um, in your notes. Okay, so Yod is a hand. Uh, Yod is also the first letter in God's name, Yahweh. Yod, He, Vav, He. Um, I don't have any vowels accompanying that, and that's because I don't know what the vowels are. Um, a lot of scholars believe the pronunciation to be Yahweh. Uh, other scholars believe that it's Yehovah, using the pronunciation of the Vav that we're teaching in this class. Um, my personal opinion is kind of irrelevant because I don't know any more than anybody else does. <laughs> Um, so if somebody's had a dream or vision, they're way ahead of me, and ahead of any scholars for that matter. So um, I think Yahweh and Yehovah are both perfectly viable alternatives, perfectly viable. Yeah, Yahweh could, could be a, a potential pronunciation too. Um, there's any number of ways to combine vowels with these letters to come up with different ways to pronounce it, and I'm sure everyone by this point has been taken and has a group um, advocating its use. Um, I don't have a whole lot of relevant input uh, for that except to say that 
when you've got 100 groups all saying they have the absolute truth, at least 99 of them are wrong. So my policy, not that it should be anybody's policy, but since I have a soapbox, I'll stand on it, um, is that uh, because the pronunciation of this name has been largely lost, we've got some good guesses. If you research it, go with the best guess you can find, and don't beat anybody else up about it because <clears throat> there's you know, a lot of other people who are just as certain as you for just as valid reasons, unless you've had a dream revision, in which case uh, you can contact me <laughs> at theregathering.com. Um, but uh, I've, I've seen a lot of arguments over this, and um, to say that through scholarly intel you've come to the exact conclusion doesn't seem to be a very uh, likely scenario to me. Um, again, it, now if you found a tape recording of somebody pronouncing the name 3,000 years ago, by all means send that to me. That's of interest not only uh, in the theological realm but also in the scientific. So, um, but in the absence of that, we just don't know. So, anyway, so uh, that's my anticlimactic. <laughs> introduction to pronouncing the name, but this is definitely how it's spelled. There's no question about that. And at PFT we say Yahweh, but we don't claim that uh, that's the one and only pronunciation. When he comes back, I'm sure we'll know loud and clear exactly what he wishes to be called. All right. For our next word, we will need another vowel sound. So, this next vowel looks like this. Just a straight line. It's written beneath the letter, beneath the consonant. And this line is called a patach. And in Sephardic Hebrew, the patach makes the exact same sound as the comets. Makes the short A, A, as in father or wall. Now you might wonder why there are two vowels that make the exact same sound. Um, and the answer is because I'm teaching Sephardic Hebrew. <laughs> In the Ashkenazic dialect, the patach makes short A, and the comets actually makes more of a short O, as in pot. A and A are very, very similar sounds, and it's easy to see how they can blend to become the same one. And I think that that's exactly what happened in the Sephardic dialect. Um, they lost the differentiation between those two sounds, and so now they both make short A. So, as your spelling words, um, you're going to pronounce the word the same whether it's got a patach or a comets. However, the technical spelling of the word will be incorrect if you substitute one for the other. It's not a big deal, at least not yet, so don't worry too much about it, but just be aware that there is a difference between the two. When we get into grammar, there are instances where you will use one instead of the other, and it'll make a little more sense then. Um, it's unfortunate that the dialect that we're learning has two vowels that have the same sound, but uh, just something we have to live with for now. <laughs> so, okay, but using the patach, Next word is a chet, with a patach underneath, followed by a yod. So, any guesses as to how this would be pronounced? Chai. Yes. First, we pronounce the ch of the chet, 
followed by the ah of the vowel, followed by the y of the yud. Um, also, a brief note about transliteration. Uh, sometimes you'll see various letters transliterated into different English letters. So this could be transliterated C-H-A-I, but it's not chai, as in chai T. It is, um, it's still chai. So anyway, I'm going to, I try to be consistent with my transliterations, but in the end, I do whatever makes it the easiest to pronounce. So don't be, don't let that throw you. Um, the important thing is the Hebrew letters, not necessarily the English ones that are depicting them. And uh, different schools of thought use different methods of transliteration. So don't let that throw you too much. I may actually slip sometimes um, into using, I'm trying to catch myself, because CH is the convention for expressing the ch sound of the chet. However, I would contend that it would confuse people less if we used a KH. Because KH is not a combination we see really in English. Um, and so that would be a, right, it would be a, exactly, it would be a good tip off that uh, we're not dealing with a ch sound here, we're dealing with a, a foreign sound to the English language. So for a while that was my convention. However, since CH is the predominant convention and that's the transliteration you're going to see elsewhere, um, you know, if you ever read anything transliterated into Hebrew, they're likely going to use a CH, so I might as well get you used to that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, also H is sometimes just used as in, yes, as in uh, Hanukkah. Okay, Hanukkah is usually not spelled CH at the beginning, it's usually just spelled H, so people think it's Hanukkah, but it is in fact Hanukkah. Not that big a deal, everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, but, so anyway, um, if I do this with the yod, switching between Y and I, don't get, uh, don't get your feathers too ruffled about it. The important thing to remember is, important thing to focus on and what I want to get you in the habit of doing is looking at the Hebrew word to, for your pronunciation. This is just to confirm to you that your pronunciation is correct. <laughs> okay, so the eventual goal is to start thinking in Hebrew associating these letters with sounds instead of associating them with, le with English letters. Okay, so that's my ultimate goal. But anyway, chai means life. And there's actually a longer form, chayim, which also means life, but uh, chai is a perfectly acceptable way of saying life. Chaim can be plural. Sometimes Chaim is also used in the singular. It's, it's indicating just one life, but it's used in a plural form. And actually there are a number of Hebrew words that do that exact same thing. And in intermediate we cover that a little bit more in depth. Um, not necessarily so much why that is, because that's a question for the scholars. <laughs> But um, that, that is, and we cover the, the really common words. Just on another tangent, one of those really common words is Elohim, which means God. Um, Elohim has the em ending, which usually indicates a plural. And sometimes Elohim is, in fact, plural. When it mentions the gods of other nations, God, lowercase g, as it were, although Hebrew has no uppercase or lowercase, um, it will say Elohim meaning it in the plural. But when it's referring to the God of Israel, Elohim is used in the singular. It has the em ending, but it's still considered a singular noun. Um, we know for a fact that it is a singular noun, okay, because of the words that are used around it. Um, in, in Hebrew grammar, you can only use a singular verb with a singular noun. For a plural noun, you need a plural verb. And every time you see Elohim referring to the God of Israel, the adjectives or verbs surrounding it are in the singular. Okay, so we know it must be singular even though it appears to be plural. Okay, so that, uh, that's a question that inevitably comes up when you start looking at Hebrew is why is Elohim plural? You know, I thought God was one. Well, he is. It's just a, it's just a form on that word that uh, can be confusing at first. So it has nothing to do with God the Father, Son, and the Spirit? Uh, no. 
Well, <clears throat> she asked, does it have anything to do with God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Spirit? My answer is no, in a nutshell, um, because, again, the forms around it are, in fact, singular. Now, you, <clears throat> perhaps it could be an allusion to, you know, the uh, different aspects of God. More likely, um, it's Eme as a majestic title. Some words are given a plural ending, not because they're plural, but to make to sort of intensify their meaning. There is a shortened form, uh, L, which is singular. And this form is often applied to the God of Israel as well, um, like in the term uh, Bethel, house of God, um, or uh, El Shaddai, okay, God of provision. So, um, so yes, the, you know, the question of the symbology of the Eme, that's open to interpretation. But as far as just strictly linguistically, it is a singular word. Okay. That, no, there, there is definitely some reason that that Eme ending is on there, but that is more of a, more of a theological question than a, you know, so. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to look into that yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's definitely something worth looking into. It's something I looked into because, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't seem to add up. I think it's that way for a reason. I think it's that way so it forces us to look at it. But there are other words that also fit that mold. Elohim is not the only one. Panim, which means face. Um, Mayim, which means water. Although Mayim technically isn't in a plural form, but it, it appears plural. Um, all these words, Chaim, which means life. All these words appear to have plural sense about them, but they're not necessarily plural words, and oftentimes they're used in the singular. Okay. Um, it's just like, it's not just like, but every English word that ends in an S is not a plural word. So now that's usually not confusing <laughs> to us, but, um, but so it is with the em ending in Hebrew. Although I think that when a word has an em ending, it's kind of asking for you to look at it and try to figure out why that is. So, okay. So that is the patach, and a word using the patach, chai. All right, are there any questions about um, Zion, Chait, Tate, Yod, or patach? Yes? Okay. Okay. Is there a connection between the yod and the cubit measurement? That's a good question. Um, I don't have the term for cubit memorized, but the term is not yod. It's a totally different word. So um, my short answer is no. Um, although they do, yod is is representing the hand in terms of function and the term cubit is representing a unit of measurement. So that would be the primary difference. Um, but no, it doesn't, um, when it's measuring things in cubits, it doesn't say in yods or in yods, in hands. Okay, it is, it is in fact a different word. Okay. But um, since I don't know the word offhand, there could be some connection within the word itself at some point. But, um, but in essence, it's not the same word, so. <laughs>